Hey now, Board Game Brawlers! My name is Nick, and today we are taking a look at Zombie Side. This is from Guillotine Games, published by Cool Mini or Not. Now, this was a hugely successful Kickstarter game, made over $900,000, and its big brother, Zombie Side Season 2, made even more than that. And it was also really popular when it came to retail as well. Of course, the zombie craze is very popular at the moment, and there's all kinds of different zombie games. There's brief little card games, and there's games like Zpocalypse, which are more like The Walking Dead, where you're trying to survive day to day through the zombie apocalypse. But Zombie Side is more of a snapshot of a more action oriented zombie movie, like the newest Dawn of the Dead or 28 Days Later, where you're just trying to shoot as many zombies as you can and complete your objective, which is either to grab stuff or rescue someone or just get through a city. So it's very, much more action oriented than a lot of the other zombie games. So, it's another zombie game. Does it do enough to set itself apart from its brethren? Well, I'm going to show you a little bit about the game, and then we're going to come back and I'll tell you what I think. Okay, so I'm not going to go through every single detail of the game, but I'm going to tell you enough to give you a brief overview of what to expect from Zombie Side. So, at the beginning of the game, everyone's going to choose a different survivor. And in the base game, you have six different survivors to choose from. And you can deal them out randomly or choose your favorite. And you have all different kinds that are sort of like the archetypes of zombie movies. So, for instance, you have Phil, who is kind of like Rick from The Walking Dead. And you have uh, Amy, who's sort of like the goth girl uh, using swords and such like that. And you've got Wanda, who is the chainsaw-wielding waitress, uh, roller skating waitress. Although I should point out that you don't necessarily start with all the stuff that they have in their picture. But let's take a look at some of the other stuff that's on this card. So everyone starts off at level zero. This is the little lever level tracker up here at the top. It looks like an EKG. And everyone is going to start with a different special ability. So Wanda's special ability is to move two zones per move action. Other people have abilities like the person who looks like Rick from The Walking Dead can start with a pistol in his inventory. And the goth girl Amy can get a free move action. But Wanda's lets her move two zones for an action. So since you've only got three actions to use on your turn, that's kind of a big deal. And then as you level up, you're actually gonna gain access to more and more special abilities like an extra action. And then when you get to a certain point, you can actually choose uh, different abilities from the ones that are listed that are going to be unique to each character. And when you move the level tracker up, you've got these little level tracker markers that you're going to put here. And then when you actually choose one of two different abilities, you'll take one of these little arrows and put it on the card. And that will tell you which ability you've chosen. Now, notice that there are different colors for the level. This is important because as people level up, the threat level of the zombies that are going to come out is going to increase, determined by who has the highest level in the group. I'll get back to that in a minute, but basically the higher that someone levels up, the more likely more and more and more dangerous zombies are going to come out. The only other thing on the character card is the inventory. So the first two spots in the front are cards that are in are your cards that are in hands, your actual items that you're using. That's going to, mostly going to be weapons and stuff like that. In the back you have cards in reserve which could be anything. It could be extra equipment, extra ammo cards, or just weapons you're not currently using. Uh, sometimes you'll gain wounds if you get attacked by a zombie. If you take a wound, not only do you have to lose an equipment, but you have to take a wounded card in place of it. It takes up a slot in your inventory and if you ever gain two wounds, you die. So that's basically how it is with the survivors. So when you start the game, you're going to have a different scenario. We're just going to do a very simple scenario called Small Town, which uses four different tiles, and there's about, I don't know, eight to ten different tiles that are double-sided that all look different. The scenario will tell you what tiles to use and what stuff to put on the board. So the survivors always have a starting location, and here's the little survivor minis, and that's Wanda's mini, and there's Doug's mini, and there's all different, they're all in different colors, and each one representing your survivor. This particular scenario is for four or more survivors. It depends on the number of players and how many you want to use. We'll just assume that we have all six out here. Some of the other stuff on the board. These red markers are zombie spawn zones. Wherever there's a red marker, when the zombies have their phase, zombies are going to spawn in each of these zones. So you'll notice that we have zombie spawn zones in the four different edges of the map. Also on the map, 
we have these door tokens. Now all doors are gonna be shut at the beginning of most scenarios. If the survivors can manage to bust them open, you'll flip them over to their broken side and put them down on the board. Now the problem with that is that when you bust open doors and when you kill zombies using loud weapons, you're actually gonna make noise. In which case you'll put these little noise markers out on the board. You'll put them in these zones which are delineated by the different crosswalks when you're out in the street and different rooms when you're actually in the buildings. The more noise that's in a certain zone and the survivors actually count as noise themselves, the more likely zombies are gonna to go to that area. So you have to keep that in mind when you're doing stuff. And the other stuff on the board, we have these objective tokens. So for this particular scenario, the goal is to actually grab all four of these objective markers. And you can think of it thematically as the survivors trying to get weapons or food or whatever you like. But if the survivors can move into the rooms that have these objective markers, grab them, not only will they get experience points, but they'll be one step closer to winning the game. So the survivors always get their phase first, and they have three actions when they start off. They can move, in which case they just go to the next zone. They, or some people can get free moves and move twice like Wanda. Uh, they can search if they're inside a room. So if they're inside a building, they can use a search, in which case they'll just take the top card off of the item deck. Now, most of the cards in the item deck are weapons. So let's take, for instance, for instance the chainsaw, which is a really good weapon. These little markers indicate that it's going to make noise when you use it because it's a chainsaw. So whether you are successful in your attack on a zombie or not, you're going to put a noise marker in the, your zone. It's got a range of zero because it's a melee weapon. You have to attack in the same zone where you're at. You get to roll five dice when you attack with it, and you hit on a five or a six. The weapon also deals two damage. Now, most zombies, the regular zombies, only take one damage. However, certain zombies require that you deal at least two in order to kill it, so that makes this a very good weapon. And you have other ones like the pistol, which isn't as powerful as a chainsaw, but it does have a range of zero to one, which means you can attack in the same square or the square next to you. And you have the, excuse me, you have the fire axe, which in addition to being used, useful as a weapon in dealing two damage, which is great, it's also a quiet weapon when it's used to kill zombies, which means it doesn't create noise because you're just thunking an ax into a zombie's head. But you can also use it to break doors. And if you use it to break doors, it actually is going to make noise because you're slamming your ax into a door. So that is something to keep in mind when you're trying to use it. And there's all kinds of different ones. There's a katana, of course, because every zombie game has to have a katana. And sometimes you're just gonna find utility goods which are only useful for certain scenarios, like the bag of rice. So unless you're doing a scenario that requires you to find rice, you, this is just taking up space in your inventory. And sometimes you'll find weapon components, so like the scope. If you can combine the scope with the rifle, you can make a sniper rifle, which is pretty cool. And sometimes you'll be very unfortunate and find one of these cards which basically means that instead of finding a useful item, a zombie pops out immediately. And when the zombie phase begins, it will attack you, which is very, very nasty, unless you have actions left over in order to kill it. So searching for items is one of the actions you can do. You can also bust down doors. You can trade items with other survivors. You can use double up on actions if you want, and you can pick up objective markers. There's all kinds of things you can do with your actions. Uh, there's also other little tokens I should point out for different scenarios. There are cars. You can do car combat, which is kind of cool. And that's basically what the survivors can do on their turn. Now, unfortunately, the zombies also get a turn. When the zombies' turn begins, first you're going to take care of whatever zombies are already on the board. So let's say that you have these. These are normal walker zombies. They look like your typical zombies. They come in male and female flavors, basically nothing special. If they were already on the board, let's say they were in this zone, they each get to move a square. And they're gonna go to where, first they're gonna follow a line of sight. If they see survivors, they're gonna try to get to them. But if they don't see survivors, they're gonna go towards where there's the most noise because they think there's probably gonna be food there for them. So they have a preset, preset guidelines for where they're gonna move. 
if they actually are already in a square with a survivor when the zombie phase begins, they're going to attack. And zombies hit automatically, which means the survivor has to take a wound card into their hand. If it's their second wound card, the survivor is dead. Now, if even if there are already zombies on the board, you after all of them have moved, you still have to go through a spawning phase. How the spawning works is that you have this deck of zombie cards that's only for the zombie phase. You're going to choose the different zombie spawn zones in order and try to stick to the same order every time. And for each one, you're gonna draw a card off the top of the deck and it determines what spawns in that zone. So let's say we start in the zombie spawn zone that's closest to me and I draw this top card off the deck. Now, the colors represent the highest level of one of the characters in your group. If the highest level of each person is still in the blue zone, then simply one regular zombie spawns on the board. That's what that silhouette is, a regular zombie. Even if the highest level person is in the yellow zone, it's still just one zombie. It's not too bad. But if the highest level person in the group is in the orange zone, that means three runner zombies spawn, which is really bad. Runner zombies look like this, excuse me. And the reason why they're so much worse than normal zombies is that they actually get two actions in a round because they're running. So on the next turn, when the zombie phase begins, and the first part of it is to take care of zombies that are already on the board, this runner is gonna get to either move twice, move and attack if he moves into a survivor's square, or attack twice if he's lucky enough that there's a survivor there already. So he's really bad. He can kill someone in one turn. And you'll be getting three of them if you have that card. And then you saw that if it's all the way up in the red zone, if some survivor is already up in the red, which is the very pinnacle of their level status, then seven normal zombies pop out. Normal zombies aren't as bad as the runners, but seven of them can be a significant problem. And there's all kinds of different zombie spawn cards. This one is very similar to the last, except that at the orange level, you actually spawn a fatty zombie. Now, fatty zombies look like this. And the reason why they're nasty is because even though they can only move one space like a normal zombie, they take two damage to kill. Weapons that only deal one damage do nothing to them at all. It's a waste. But a weapon that deals two damage will be able to kill them in one hit if you successfully hit. And there's different ones here. There's ones that actually give a particular type of zombie, in this case fatties, an extra turn, an extra activation during the zombie phase. One that gives extra runners. And notice that if it's still in the blue zone for those cards, nothing happens, which is really good. And it's just some of them uh, will spawn extra zombies on the sewers instead of in the different rooms. And eventually you may even draw a card that unfortunately spawns the Abomination, which is there's only one of them in the game, there's only one miniature, and he's the strongest zombie. He takes three damage to kill. And there is really, to my knowledge, only, that I remember there's only one weapon that deals that amount of damage, and that's the Molotov Cocktail, which you can't even find in the deck. You have to assemble it. So he's really, really nasty. Now, if you actually enter a building, you actually have to draw cards from the deck to spawn in each room as well. Because you're popping into a building for the first time and it's full of the people that used to live there or work there. So you'll draw a card for every single room. So you can see that a zombie situation can quickly get out of hand if you're spawning every turn and opening up buildings. So that's the basic overview of the game. You're gonna be moving your survivors, trying to attack zombies, rolling dice equal to the number on your weapons cards, and hoping that you roll a number that counts as a success for that weapon in order to kill zombies. And every zombie you kill is gonna level you up, and every time you level up, there's a chance that there's gonna be worse and worse zombies, and you're just trying to complete your objective, in this case, grabbing the objective tokens. And those objectives are gonna change depending on the scenario. So that's zombie side. And I have to say that not only do I think this is the best zombie game that's currently out in the board game market, but it's really just a great game. I enjoy it a lot. It's not without its faults, but I think that overall, it really showed not just how good a sort of Ameritrashy, fiddly zombie game could be, but also how successful games that come off of Kickstarter can be. 
So let's talk about some of the things about it. Um, the components are just fantastic. I mean, it is fiddly. There's tons of little bits. Like you have the little marker for your level and you've got the little, uh, the other indicators for your level showing exactly what abilities you chose and then all the little tokens you put on the board. So that can be annoying if you're not a m typical miniatures gamer that's used to that type of stuff. But once you get into the swing of it and once you actually get it set up and get through the game, it's, it goes really smoothly and you don't really worry about that so much. You've got high quality uh, tiles, really awesome looking miniatures, I have to say. Even if you don't paint them, and I don't, they just look great and you can definitely clearly tell them apart. The only exception is one of the actual Survivor minis, the one that's uh, supposed to be like Rick from The Walking Dead, is like the same color as the zombie minis, which can get confusing at times. But he's the one with the gun, so it's, it's easy to tell it apart eventually. Uh, so all the components are good. The rule book, uh, the first edition of the rule book, if you have the first edition of the game, the first printing, and I'm not even sure that they've um, changed it in future printings, has a lot of uh, just mistakes and things that they've eroded, including other extra stuff that they've added, like giving difficulty ratings to the different scenarios and suggested number of survivors, which is really great. So if you get the game, I'm really going to suggest that you print out a new copy of the rule book, or at least have a copy on your laptop or iPad ready to look at at a moment's notice, because it just helps a lot. Um, I will say that the game, the gameplay mechanics themselves are good and solid. I mean, it's a it's a solid co-op game, and sometimes it falls prey to the same things that all co-op games fall prey to, which is that one player can kind of rule over the others and say, you go here, and you go here, and I think you should do this. And it can feel, it can start to feel like um, too many chiefs and not enough Indians. But overall, because of the nature of the game, because it gets so frantic so fast with zombies just pouring in that sometimes you just can't worry about what other people are doing. You have to worry about yourself. So I like that. And speaking of that, I do think that this game captures that aspect of the zombie apocalypse very well. Of zombies just flooding in from every direction and trying to kill you and your group. And it just gets, it can get overwhelming. It kind of depends on the scenario, but if you're doing well, and maybe you don't feel that, but when you're not, when you have some bad rolls and you're able, to, you're not able to take out zombies quickly, they can just swarm you. And in that regard, that is a fault of the game that is very, it's very luck based. I mean, it's a, it's a dice chucking game. If you don't have the right weapons and you, you can't mitigate the luck factor enough, you're going to do poorly. But even then, there's strategy. You still, you can still determine where you're going to move. You can do, you know, fight or flight what's the best option at any given time. And you're still working together like, okay, maybe you have to die so that the rest of us can live if you can distract the zombies, those types of tough decisions. But that does lead me to probably the two biggest sticking points of the game. And if you go on board GameGeek, if you read reviews there or on Amazon, everyone's gonna say the same two things. First is player elimination. It's very possible that you do a very long scenario and you die <laughs> very early. And if you die, you're out. In this edition of the game, in this printing, there's really no rule unless you home rule it for you to actually come back and participate in the game. If you're playing in a game with less survivors being used, I suppose that you can just say, okay, my guy died, I'm going to take this survivor and keep playing. I'll start at the start of the map. But it's kind of wonky and it doesn't really work. It's not part of the rules. So player elimination is a problem. The other thing that's even more of a problem that people constantly complain about is the rules for shooting a ranged weapon into a square where there are both zombies and survivors. As I mentioned in the overview, if you are doing that, you're gonna hit your survivors first. And that's a little crazy. I can understand why they did it. I can understand that it's sort of an artificial difficulty enhancer, so to speak, but it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like, <laughs> these are slow moving, so some of them are zombies and who look very, very different from your survivors, why is it an automatic guarantee that you're going to hit one of your buddies? If you want to home rule it, you could say that there's a chance roll, like if you roll a d6 and you roll a one, you accidentally hit your buddies, or you can just say that, or you, know, you could just say that you your buddy gets bonuses to not get hit, depending on the number of zombies that are in there, whatever you want to do, or you can just leave it as it is if it's not a big deal for your group, but it is a weird little rule, and I can understand why people are upset about it. But other than that, I think this game is a great co-op game, and like I said, the best zombie game out there. It's a little pricey, you can catch some sales on it now, but uh, if you like miniatures, if you like zombies, if you like co-op games, and especially if you like all three, 
I don't think you can go wrong with Zombicide. I'm eagerly awaiting Season 2 and some of the other expansions that are coming out, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. So, this is Nick signing off, and until the next time, get out there and game every day and in every way.